Good morning and welcome to Jersey Shore Baptist Church. If you're able, let's all stand as we go to our first song, 133 Angels We Have Heard On High. Angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plain, and the mountains in reply echo back their joyous strain.
All right. Praise the Lord for the little kids and that song. Let's uh, open up in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful um, once again for us to be able to have church and be able to hear your word preached and to be able to sing praises to you and to uplift and encourage one another. And I just pray that you bless this time, pray that you'd work in a tremendous way. And uh, Lord, just uh, have your hand over this service. We're thankful for it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to go to our next song, page number 135. Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Glory to the newborn King. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled. via Facebook or whatever this is, Zoom. Uh, we're glad you guys are here. And we do have people watching via Facebook as well and some people I, I'm sure that are on the website. If you're watching on Facebook or on, um, or on the website, if you would do us a favor and just let us know you're here, say hello uh, so we can keep in touch with you. Also, there's a little button on the website called uh, Church Member Information Update. I think, is that the name that's on there? Something to that effect. And it doesn't matter if you're a church member or just a, a regular attender. If you haven't done it in a while, go on that, click on that button and, and update your information. Make sure we have all the correct information. We're trying to stay in touch with everybody in the midst of this pandemic. We're losing track of people. And we don't like to lose track of people. So let us know where you are, how, what the best way is to get a hold of you. And we'll make sure that we inform you about stuff going on here at the church. If we're having a special activity or if there's been any changes at all to the services, we can keep you updated about all those things. Also, if you're visiting with us for the first time, I don't see any...
first time visitors here in the auditorium, but if you're visiting with us for the first time online and you'd like more information about the church, there's a button called uh, My Response, and uh, you can give us some information and we'll you know, let you know what's going on here at the church as well. But it's good to have everybody here. This is Christmas Sunday, and uh, it's quite a difference from last year at Christmas Sunday, I'll tell you that. Uh, last year, we had one service, and it had probably five times the number of people in it in one service. But this is the world that we're living in right now. Uh, this is the COVID. We're in the midst of the COVID-19. We're not uh, pre or post. We're right in the middle of it. And so as a result, uh, church attendance is taking quite a hit. So, But we're glad that you're here, whether you're here via technology or you're here in person. It's just good to be in the house of God with you and to worship the Lord together, celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All right, we're going to sing a chorus, number 233 in your hymn book. If you're using a hymn book, if not, we'll have it up on the screens. We'll even have it on the screens for you folks. Number 233, for God so loved the world. Let's all stand. Let's sing it out. We, need, we had 150 plus people here last year. We need to make that kind of volume, <laughs> uh, even though there's not nearly that many people here, all right? Amen, let's sing it out. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son to die on Calvary's tree, of sin to set me free. So love the world, he gave his only son to die on Calvary's tree. No sin to set me free, someday he's coming back. What glory that will be! Wonderful is love to me. Amen. Remain standing for the scripture reading. All right. Good morning, everybody. We're going to be in Galatians, Galatians chapter four, and we will read verse four and verse five. Galatians chapter four, verse four and five. I'll read verse four and then all together we will read verse five. Once again, that's Galatians chapter four, and I'll begin in verse four. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law. Altogether, verse 5, to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. Praise the Lord for the reading of His Word as we sing another song. Amen. Remain standing. 141. It came upon a midnight clear. It came upon Yeah. 
announcements. I forgot to uh, announce this at the early service, but there won't be church this Wednesday night due to Christmas Eve um, uh, because we're going to be having the Christmas Eve service on Thursday night. Uh, The 2021 budget is available. It's on the um, baptistry there. Um, We're going to be voting on that next Sunday evening. Um, We're going to be having a Christmas fellowship tonight at our evening service at five o'clock and we'll be having our annual ugly sweater Christmas fellowship and we'll enjoy a great time of fellowship and refreshments. And um, we're looking forward to that tonight. Christmas Eve candlelight service will be December 24th. That's Thursday at 5 o'clock. And we encourage all those who are planning on attending, if you haven't already, to register for that on our website. That will give us an idea of how many people will be coming. If you need help with registering for that, you can see Waiter and myself will be happy to help you with that. And that's this Thursday evening at 5 o'clock. Christmas Eve um, candlelight service. We won't be having church on Wednesday. It'll be Thursday, December 24th. And I mentioned our annual church business meeting, December 27th. That's immediately following the evening service um, on December 27th. That's next Sunday evening. And then vision night will be January 3rd, and they'll be unveiling the theme for the new year and reflecting on the blessings uh, from 2020 and announcing some plans for 2021. Um, Always look forward to that. And then uh, Homeless Ministry, Hope Through Grace, they're always looking for uh, donations to help out the homeless there in Atlantic City. And um, they put together some care packages um, for the homeless there in Atlantic City and go out, I believe, at least once a week. If you have any questions about that, you can see Mrs. Darla Griffin or Mrs. Becker, and they'll be happy to give you information. We always have uh, the list of items on our um, bulletin and on the website where we post the bulletin. And for those that are uh, watching online, or for those of us that are here, we have the offering box there at the back of the church. And for those that are watching online, you can give through our website. There's a giving link, the phone number that you can text to give, and then you can always mail in your offering. And we're just going to take some time to thank the Lord for meeting the needs of the church and pray for the offering. Father, Lord, we thank you, God, for this morning, Lord. We thank you, God, that we can gather together to worship you, Lord, to celebrate your birth. And, God, we thank you that you, you came down to... Uh, be born to die, Lord, and thank you, God, for your love and, and grace and mercy um, to us. God, we pray, Lord, that you would just be with this offering, Lord. I pray, God, that you would just bless it and multiply it, Lord. Be with those that give, Lord. Pray that you would bless them, and um, I thank you, God, for um, how you've met the needs of the church this year, Lord, and we, we praise you and thank you for that, and we pray, God, that you would just be with the remainder of the service, Lord. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.
Church, you're dismissed. You're going that way this time. And we're going to be in Galatians chapter 4, and we're going to look at one other passage of Scripture I'm going to ask you to turn to in Ephesians, um, but we're going to start out in the book of Galatians in chapter 4. By the way, um, for the fellowship tonight, if you're going to come, and we hope you do plan on coming. If you can, no big deal if you can't. We have some stuff over there. We have some cookies and things. We'll have coffee. But um, if you can bring like a little snack item or a dessert or whatever, uh, the plan is tonight we're going to have a shorter than normal service, and then we're going to jump into the fellowship. You're supposed to wear some kind of ugly sweater. And um, Wade bought an ugly sweater. I, he, he, he showed it to us yesterday, but I told him he could just wear a normal s sweater. And he'd be a shoe in to win the contest, uh, just with the face above the sweater. So, uh, but uh, anyway, bring uh, bring your ugly sweater, and also, if you can, if, you know, I know it's kind of like last minute. We haven't been really making a lot of announcements about this because, like so many other things we've been doing here, they've been canceled. So uh, we were supposed to do praise and pie a couple weeks back. We weren't able to do that, so uh, we didn't know for sure what was going to happen. But it looks like tonight we'll be on. And so if you can bring a little snack item or dessert item, that would be wonderful. Um, all right, Galatians chapter 4, I'm going to read beginning in verse 1. Uh, I'm honing in on verses 4 and 5. And uh, I'm not taking verses 4 and 5 out of context, but verses 4 and 5 kind of are supporting verses for the overall theme of being an heir of Christ. And, um, but verses 4 and 5 have to do with the timing regarding Christ's coming the first time. And so it says in verse, uh, chapter 4 and verse 1, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, 
And basically what that's saying is, and again, it would be in the overall context of the book of Galatians, a servant and a child that is an heir. They're treated very similarly as long as the child is young. But when the child gets to be a full age, um, he's treated differently than a servant would be treated. You follow what I'm saying? And then in verse 2 it says, but is under tutors and governors, as a child, as a small person, is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. And now he kind of ties in the illustration why he's saying that. Even so we, talking about Christians, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But notice verse 4, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. And we'll stop there because, again, I'm not, my, my purpose this morning is not to develop this whole theme about being an heir of God. My purpose this morning is, is honing in on that phrase in verse 4, the fullness of the time. It says, when the fullness of the time was co come, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. So Christ came the first time. Christ came to be born as a babe in Bethlehem when the fullness of time was come. Now we, uh, that's the Bible phrase. We're going to see that almost identical phrase in Ephesians also. But we would say something like this, when the time was just right, when, when everything was ready that's when Christ came and so my my thought this morning is Christ came the first time when the time was just right and I want to launch from that and develop this concept that Christ will come back again when the time is just right so we want to explore both of these um, but let's pray first father thank you for the opportunity to gather together and worship you and uh, Lord it's whether we're, I guess, in our living rooms uh, watching the service via technology or whether we're here in the auditorium, uh, we can worship you. We can worship you anywhere we are, and, we, and God, help us to do that and to do it even more often than these corporate services that we gather together in. And Father, help us to celebrate also uh, the arrival of your son, Jesus Christ, and where would we be if Jesus hadn't come to this earth? Father, we pray that you would help us, Lord, to consider these scriptures here in Galatians and then the scriptures we're going to look at in Ephesians. And as we consider the first advent when Christ came to the earth, help us also to consider the second advent when Christ will come and beginning with the rapture of the church and then eventually return to the earth to set up his millennial kingdom. And God, I pray you'd help us to see the connection between the two, the idea that we're waiting for when the time is just right. And uh, that time may be very soon. We hope it is. But God, it's in your timing, not ours. And so we pray you'd help us to understand that. For it's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. When the fullness of time, when the time is just right. You know, it seems like we do a lot of waiting uh, in this life. Um, a lot of the time we spent on earth is is waiting for something to happen. Uh, young people are waiting to grow up. They can't wait till they're 17 so they can get their driver's license and, or get a car, or they can't wait till they get married. And, you know, there's a lot of waiting. There's a lot of anticipation in this life. I remember when I was a kid, I couldn't wait for Christmas to come. Um, you know, Christmas was the big holiday, and of course, at the time when I was a kid, I didn't really understand much about the true meaning of Christmas. I knew it had to do with Jesus and his uh, coming to the earth, and I understood all the facts about it, but it wasn't very important to me, that aspect of it. But I, I loved the tradition, I loved the tree, I loved the, you know, uh, all this 
stuff that have become part of Christmas, the Christmas presents and even giving presents. I loved all of it. And Christmas was a big deal in our home, just as probably it's a big deal in your home. And our young children, they anticipate Christian, uh, Christmas. And, and I'm sure that though they, they our young people understand what the true meaning of Christmas is, they're still anticipating that day that they can go under the tree and open up all their presents and they're excited about it. And, and naturally so. And so, but they wait for it. I remember, uh, it, uh, for me, it, there was always an empty kind of a feeling when it finally arrived. Um, you know, it got there, we opened our presents, and, and then I would, is this it? Is it all over? There's no, there's no more presents? You know, you want to tear apart the couch or something. I want to open something else. You know what I mean? You just get, you, you just get so, you're, you've been looking forward to it for so long. And I shared this morning, I don't, think, I don't think the things that we look forward to with anticipation, when they arrive, they never quite, you know, meet that expectation. Vacations come to mind. You know, you're looking forward to going on vacation. You're talking about, man, we're going to go on vacation. It's going to be awesome. And then sh- sure, you know, when the vacation comes, the car breaks down or somebody throws up in the back seat or, you know, some kind of crazy thing. The vacations never, I mean, they're good, but they're never quite as good as we anticipate. And by the way, they're never quite as good as we look back on. You know, we, the, Dr. Gray used to make this statement all the time. He said, the past and the future are both liars. He says, you look forward to something and it always looks so good in the future. You look back, it looks back so good in the past. But when it's actually there, it's never quite what you expect or quite what you remember. And so, but we do spend a lot of time waiting, anticipating. And, you know, the people of God, Israel, they were waiting for literally millennia for the promised Messiah. You know, the people of God had their struggles from their very beginning, back from the days of Abraham, and and they had their struggles, and they had their battles, and and of course, they spent 400 years in bondage, and even when they were delivered from the bondage, they had internal struggles, and struggles in the land of Canaan, and then more internal struggles, and idolatry, and all kinds of problems, but, but uh, and then finally, the Babylonians came, and then the Medes and the Persians, and then the Greeks, and then the Romans, but, but they knew that someday, someday soon, their Messiah was going to come, and he was going to... He was going to make all things right, and they waited and waited and waited. Um, And I bet, though, that there were many people in Israel, because they waited for so long, if you ever wait for something a real long time, you begin to doubt that it's ever going to happen. I mean, when we were, uh, when I first got saved, I mean, you know, uh, the, the, the second coming of Christ was just like a, it was like a big deal, you know, like I, I was anticipating Christ's return. And I've been saved now for 30 years, and he hasn't come in my 30 years. I thought he was going to come back in 1993. I was sure. I, I didn't set a date, but I was almost positive. It was going to be 1993. My theory was a thousand years is but a day, and a day is but a thousand years. If you, you know, go back in Bible chronology, you, you, you trace us back about 6,000 years. According to Paul's timetable, we're at 5,000 800, no, 67, we're 130 years away, right? Something like that. We're about 130 years away, according to the Jewish calendar, from the sixth day, 6,000 years. And then, of course, you know, God created the earth in six days, and on the seventh day, he he rested. And the thousandth year, that final thousand years or that final day will be the the millennial reign of Christ. Now, if Paul's right, we've got a long time before the rapture is going to take place. Uh, But he's not a date setter either. But I'm just saying, when I first got saved, man, I was looking up constantly. I saw an event in the newspaper that talked about any kind of inclination towards a world government. I was like, ah, see, it's coming. But I mean, man, world government. What in the world is happening today? And it's it's like I, I think we need to sometimes step back and just look at what's happened in the past 20 years, you know, from maybe 9-11 or Y2K before 9-11 and, and all the stuff that's happening. And it's almost like because we're living in the middle of it, we don't, it, 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 we, it doesn't really register as much. But if you look back and see how 
Everything is kind of funneling and pouring into place, getting ready for the second advent. We're probably no different from the people that were living in the time of Christ. I bet you there were conversations. People would, you know, they'd be talking about how bad the Jewish religious system is or the Roman government or whatever, and they would say, yeah, but Messiah's coming. And, ah, you've been saying that for years. He's never going to come. Or, yeah, he'll come maybe someday, but it's not going to be in our lifetime. And they doubted. And it's natural, I guess, for us to doubt, but we know Christ did come. Why, why did he come then, at that time? Well, it was the fullness of the time. It was the time when it was just right. And, and what does that mean? Well, that means everything was as it should be. God had a predetermined plan a predetermined time to send his son to the manger in Bethlehem. The conditions were just what they needed to be for Christ to come and be born. And not just be born, but ultimately also to die for the sins of the world. But what is the fullness of time? What did that entail? What had to be in place in order for Christ to come the first time? Well, first of all, we know that things were very bad at that time in, in some respects. You may say things are bad today, and, and I'm sure there have been many periods of time where we could say that things were bad. I'm sure the Jewish people during World War II would say things could never be worse than they are today, and, and that would certainly be true. And we may be uh, experiencing some more bad times even prior to the return of Christ, but things were very bad on the earth for the Jewish people especially. Remember, they were not independent, they were not a sovereign nation they were given permission to operate somewhat, but they were under the control of the Roman government. But not only that, they had a religious system that was completely corrupt. Judaism had become completely corrupt. The people of God were going through all the motions of religion, but their hearts were as far from God as they could be. The chief priests and the council made up of Pharisees and Sadducees were the for the most part, they were very unscrupulous people. They cared far more about, about their prestige and their power and their money and their traditions than they did about loving and serving the people of God. And uh, Jesus, obviously, in the New Testament, we've studied often how Jesus rebuked these religious people often because they were really anything but faithful people that had a true relationship with God. John Phillips discusses uh, this idea in his commentary on, on Galatians and uh, talking about or explaining what this fullness of time meant. And he explains that mankind had to go through different periods of miserable failure. And they eventually, God brought them under the Mosaic law and even there they failed more miserably. The Mosaic law didn't fix anything. The Mosaic law caused them to see how great failures they really were. But this is what Philip said. He said, when the fullness of time came, Judaism was a dead religion, a religion of rite and ritual, of form and ceremony, of tradition and crushing legalism. The Gentiles, weary to death of their own bankrupt religions, turned hopefully toward Judaism. They thought, hey, we'll, we'll turn to Judaism. Judaism will solve our problems. But of course, as you know, the, the Jews were separatists. So he goes on to say, they turned toward Judaism only to be repelled by Jewish hostility and hypocrisy and by its bitter exclusiveness and rigid bondage to dead forms and narrow views. So these Gentiles that surrounded and lived really in the midst of the Jews said, well, these Jews are religious people. Maybe their religion is the answer. And they said they're, they're certainly religious, so they, they, they investigated what Judaism was all about, and they found out what, that Judaism was a completely false and corrupt system of religion, and it was no better than what they had. So religiously, things were a mess. But not only religiously, the political system was very oppressive. The Roman Empire ruled with an iron fist. And though the nation of Israel did enjoy some religious freedom during that time period, the government was becoming increasingly impatient 
and intolerant of the Jewish people. Much like our government is becoming increasingly impatient and intolerant with Christians today. But in that day, anti-Semitism was widespread and it was getting worse every day. Warren Wiersbe said this, he said, historians tell us that the Roman world was in great expectation, waiting for a deliverer. At the time when Jesus was born, the old religions were dying. The old philosophies were empty and powerless to change men's lives. Strange new mystery religions, we were just talking about that, Gnosticism, strange new mystery religions were invading the empire. Religious bankruptcy and spiritual hunger were everywhere. People were looking for an answer. Let me ask you this. It just popped into my mind. As John Hamlin would say, this just in. <laughs> it, people are, are people out there, do they have the same questions about what's going on? And can they look to us for answers? Like, they probably say, well, those Christians are just as wacky as we are. They don't have the answers to, to these problems. But anyway, going back to what Wearsby said, he said, he said the old philosophies were empty and powerless to change men's lives. Ch uh, strange new mystery religions were invading the empire. Religious bankruptcy and spiritual hunger were everywhere. God was preparing the world for the arrival of his son. The fullness of time meant that man was ready to admit that they could not accomplish salvation on their own. The schoolmaster of the law, which is what... Galatians tells us it was a schoolmaster. The schoolmaster had done its job. The students were now ready to graduate. Kostenberger, who wrote a great introduction to the New Testament, said this, this marked a new phase in salvation history, subsequent to the period during which the law served as the primary point of reference. So now we're, we're coming into a post-law period. People, by and large, Inside Judaism, outside Judaism, realized that religion couldn't do anything for them, that the law didn't work. And now the Roman government was oppressing them and things were bad. People were looking for something. There's, there's got to be something better than this. And there was this talk for centuries, for millennia, of a coming Messiah. So things were bad. Things were ripe. People were ready for a change. They were sick and tired of the status quo. But there were also some good things that were part of the Roman Empire that were necessary for, for the fullness of time to come. And, and when I say good, I don't mean pleasing things or happy things. I mean things that were necessary, technological, and these are all kind of technological advances that had to be in place at that time so that the gospel could spread. Remember, we have an empire now. We're not just a group of people living in a central geographic area. God now wants the gospel to go forth throughout the whole world. And things needed to be in place for that to happen. So, the Roman Empire, first of all, had what they called the Pax Romana, which was a world peace. Even though they were corrupt and there were internal problems and there was some crime and things like that, at the time that Christ came, there were no major wars taking place within the empire. The, the laws were forced, enforced by the heavy hand of Caesar. Caesar did not tolerate any dissension. If any dissension rose up anywhere, he would put it down. You know, he would execute anybody that, that, that tried to oppose him at all. But there was a world peace. And let's face it, world wars would have a... They, they would have a hindering effect on the spread of the gospel. And so this world peace, this Pax Romana was in place. The Romans had also developed a road system that allowed people to travel freely, freely throughout the empire. Uh, though Christ himself would never leave Palestine, his apostles would take the gospel throughout the entire civilized world. These road systems needed to be in place. We shared this morning about the... the um, uh, interstate road system, if you were, I, I found a letter one time, my brother and I used to, we used to go into old abandoned houses, this was a thing we used to do, we used to like, we'd find an old abandoned house all boarded up and everything, you know those creepy old houses everybody in the neighborhood said, oh, that's a haunted house, we'd find these old 150, 200 year old houses and we would break into them, 
usually in the middle of the night. I was always scared to death. And we would go creeping around. Sometimes it's dangerous, but you got to be careful where you're walking. And those floors are bad. But we found in the floorboard of an attic of this house on Adamston Road, we found a bunch of letters. And so we found a bunch of old Bibles and stuff like that up there too. We found a bunch of letters. And one letter was from a lady that was talking about coming down to visit this house on Adamston Road, which is in Bricktown. From, and she lived in like Long Island. And they were talking about this trip was going to take a week. Now this was back in the late 1800s. This letter was from 1890 something. So they didn't have cars. I don't I think they, they did have cars, but likely these people with the letters didn't have a car. And they were talking about this horse and buggy trip that they were going to take. And it was going to take that long to get there. Then later on, you know, went with the advent of cars, you could take like Route 1 or Route 9 uh, to get down to, say, South Jersey. But even then, you're talking about a five, six, seven hour drive traveling down Route 9. But then came the parkway. And the parkway, with its two lanes at the time, now four lanes up north, six or seven lanes, I mean, it allows you to get from place to place relatively quickly. The interstate system allowed us to get to places, you know, I can get to Texas in 25 hours, 25 and a half hours, to where Phil lives. And that was unheard of, you know, 50, 60 years ago. It's the same thing in the Roman Empire, they didn't have good road systems, but the Roman government provided a system of roads. They didn't have cars or anything like that, but they did allow for relatively easy travel throughout the empire. And the gospel would need that because Paul would travel and all these other uh, missionaries would travel. They also developed, the Romans did, a sophisticated postal system, and that allowed the written word to be sent to places very quickly. Whereas maybe it would be impossible to get word to somebody that lived hundreds or thousands of miles away. Now you could get it to them very quickly and, and the gospel was spread um, through letters. Paul's writings are all letters. Not only that, but the Greek language was in place and the Greek language was universal. And so people throughout the empire, anybody who was educated understood the Greek language. And even though it was a Roman government with a Latin language... The Greek language was pretty much the universal language. The Bible, the New Testament, was all written in Greek. And uh, so it's kind of like today, you know, English is, is it's a pretty widespread language. I think it's still more widespread than Spanish, but maybe not. But I mean, you can go to any place in the world. You go to the Philippines, and the Philippine people, most of them know at least a little bit of English. And it's a widespread, and that's why I believe, by the way, the... The God has used the King James Bible the way he has because it's an English Bible and that English Bible was used to spread the gospel throughout the whole world. Well, the Greek language back in the time of Christ was in place. And so the Greek language was used by God to spread the gospel and all of that had to be in place. So all these things were in place and they allowed the message of the gospel to travel quickly and freely throughout the world. So everything was where it ought to be in order for God to do what God wanted to do through the coming of the Messiah. But even though the world conditions were ripe, I'm sure there were many among the people of God that were basically oblivious to the fact that the Messiah that they so long awaited was actually going to come. They were still... Just like we are, we're in the middle of all these really unparalleled events in our history that are taking place right now. I, I shared earlier that the guy, one of the guys that ran for president, I forget his name, but one of the guys that ran for president, he, he, he believes that everybody should be tattooed. That, uh, has, that if you've gotten the virus, you should have some kind of tattoo on you to prove that you had the, the not the virus, the vaccine. Now, I mean, it's, that's not going to happen, at least not yet. There was, I mean, there was a, a firestorm of, of protest when, when he announced that on, I think, Twitter. But, uh, you know, they, the people were saying, yeah, they did that in World War II. They branded people who were Jewish so we would know who the Jews were. And, uh, you know, so it's just crazy. But I'm just saying that this is all happening. If somebody was to have said that, 30 or 40 years ago. I mean, it would just be 
But it's, I mean, this is like common knowledge, you know, the whole thing about the chip technology is, everybody is talking about, Bill Gates talks about it all the time. And so this is all happening right around us, and it's, it's craziness. But just as there were people in Jesus' day, there are people today that are just oblivious to what's happening. And listen, the, the Old Testament prophecies were all there. Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Isaiah chapter 9, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Micah even pinpointed the exact location of his birth. He said, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. So even though the signs were all there, everything was in place, the Messiah comes, still the people of God were living in rejection of that truth. It's, he came into his own, and his own received him not. And of all people, they should have been able to look at the signs and look at the prophecies and see that this was all happening right now, right in front of them. And we're in exactly the same thing, same position. All the signs are there. Everything seems to be ready or nearly ready. I don't know what else needs to be done as far as God's concern. I know prophetically nothing else needs to happen in order for the rapture to take place where the the whole concept of imminence is an important factor involving the rapture, meaning that, that we cannot pinpoint the exact time. We're awaiting it. We're expecting it really at any moment. But everything is where it needs to be. Um, and when the fullness of time comes, Christ is going to come back. But the unfortunate thing is, is many of God's people are going to be oblivious to that, just as God's people were oblivious back in the time of Christ's first advent. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. It's the only other passage I said I wanted to look at. Ephesians chapter 1. Just really a page over or two in your Bible. Ephesians chapter 1, I'll begin in verse 7. I'm really heading again towards one phrase. Same phrase, but different context. The the phrase in Galatians is speaking about the context of the first coming. And the phrase in Ephesians is speaking really about Christ coming to set up his kingdom, which begins with the rapture of the church. And so in verse 7 it says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, notice this, that in the dispensation of the fullness, same word, uh, pleroma, fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest, is kind of like the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. But notice verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time. Almost the same phrase. But in Ephesians, Paul is emphasizing that the time would come or the time would be full when God would bring together all believers, both Jews and Gentiles. And of course, this is a reference to that future millennial kingdom. But that all begins, the millennial kingdom begins with the rapture of the church and then the period of tribulation on the earth and then the return of Christ to set up His kingdom on the earth. Uh, J. Vernon McGee said this, He said, God is moving everything forward to the time when Christ will rule over all things in heaven and earth. This is the fullness, the pleroma, there's that word, when everything is going to be brought 
under the rulership of Jesus Christ. The pleroma is like a vast receptacle into which centuries and millenniums have been falling. All that is past, present, and future is moving toward the time when every knee must bow and every tongue must confess that Jesus is Lord. And we're getting very, very close to that time. The idea in Ephesians is that all of the events in the earth of the earth are moving toward or pouring into that time and place when every knee would bow and every tongue would confess. Um, but this dispensation of the fullness of time referred to in Ephesians, it's not here quite yet, but it may be here very soon. And, and let me say this, especially to you young people, are you okay with that? And Mr. Wade just walked out the door. He's mad because he wants to get married in the spring, but the, the, the fullness of the time may come before his wedding. I, I hope it don't. I hope he gets married. Um, I hope he get, gets married before... Uh, Stephanie realizes who she's marrying. <laughs> I hope they, they seal the deal on that before she has a chance to escape. But, um, but I mean, I get it. You know, we want to live life. We want to continue. We want to have kids and grandkids. And we want to do the things that we know. Um, you know, it's like that illustration. I'll never forget that, that Kerry Schmidt illustration about he was taking his son. His son was five years old. And he used to take his son every Friday uh, to a place called Dimples, which we don't have here, but it's kind of like Chuck E. Cheese. And so every Friday he would take them to Dimples. And so they, they go, they, they stop to get something to eat, and he says, I got, a, I got a surprise for you. Today, we're not going to Dimples. We're going to Disneyland. I'm taking you to Disneyland. Now, that kid never been to Disneyland. And you know what he said? I don't want to go to Disneyland. I want to go to Dimples. Now, now you know, picture Chuck E. Cheese over there in, in, in the, the, over in Mays Landing there. Picture it. I mean, you walk in and you slide around because it's so greasy and dirty and everything else. This little five-year-old is just, I mean, I mean, he just wants to go there because he's got no clue what Disneyland is all about. Matter of fact, Harry Schmidt tells the story, he's in the back of the car pouting and having a little temper tantrum because he don't want to go to Disneyland. He wants to go to Dimples. And man, when they got to Disneyland, it's just, that kid was like, oh, <laughs> well, what is this? And, and that's the way we are here on this little rat-infested place called Earth. And we're holding on to everything that we think is so good, but man, there's something infinitely, uh, billions of time better waiting for us up in heaven. And it's coming. It's, it's coming soon. Everything's moving in that direction. Listen, Jesus reminded us about this. Paul reminded us about this. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. Jesus promised, listen, I'm coming back for you. In 1 Corinthians 15, about the rapture, he said, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, a parallel passage to the passage in 1 Corinthians 15. It says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Peter, we're not in 2 Peter yet. We're going to be jumping into 2 Peter in a couple of weeks. In 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter spoke a lot about this, and I'll, I'll pull some verses out of the passage. If you want to turn there and look at it, you're welcome to do so. But in verse 1 of 2 Peter chapter 3, it says, this second epistle, letter, they traveled, let, letters, they delivered them through their postal system. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds, by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets 
and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers. And, and I expect the world to be scoffers about what we're saying about Christ coming back. But I think there are a lot of Christians that are secret scoffers. They, they doubt that this is ever going to happen. But he says, in the last days, the time we're in right now, there's going to be scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Down in verse 8, it says, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. In other words, he have not forgotten about it. He, he's not just neglecting something he needs to do. He's not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but his long-suffering to us were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The only thing that holds God back is there are people out there that still need to be saved. And in this crazy time period that we're living in with all the chaos and confusion, pain and suffering that's going on around us, it could be that God is using all of that to draw people unto himself. And they need salvation. In uh, verse 17 of that same chapter, it says, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before, beware lest you also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace and in knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Listen, we're waiting, we're anticipating. Listen, don't get led away. This world and some backslidden Christians will, will, will want to pull you out of the will of God. Man, you stay the course. Continue, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Listen, Jesus is going to come back when his bride is ready, when the church is complete. In Romans chapter 11, he talks about Israel, and he said, blindness in part hath come upon Israel. He says, until the fullness, the same word, pleroma, the fullness of the Gentiles become in. When the bride is complete, when everything's ready, when the time is just right, Christ is coming back. We don't know when, but we believe the fullness of time is coming very soon. May even be right at the doors. It seems like all the signs that Jesus spoke of are in place. In Matthew 24, he talks about all the crazy stuff that are, that are going to be happening right before his coming. And he said there's going to be kingdom, nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom and famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places, all these are the beginnings of sorrows, and we've been seeing these ha things happening for quite some time now. It seems like all the signs are there for Christ's return. We can't be sure about the exact day, but we can be sure about the fact that he will come in the fullness of time, when the time is just right. Another thing I can tell you for sure is that if you're not saved, you're not ready for his second coming. The fullness of time for your salvation is today. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2, Behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Listen, don't put off salvation. If you're not sure you're going to heaven when you die, you need to get that matter taken care of today. And by the way, Christian, if you're putting off something that you know the Lord wants you to do, you need to get that right because time is running out. Don't put off witnessing to the people you love because you're, you're not guaranteed an opportunity tomorrow. It's going to happen just like that. Dr. Gray used to say, you're going to turn around twice, you're going to be gone. And then it's going to be too late. We won't be able to do anything. And we'll all be saying on our way up, man, he said he was coming. I just never thought it was going to happen. Just like the people of Israel said when Jesus came the first time, man, he said he was going to send the Messiah but we never believed it was really going to happen. Listen, I'm telling you, he's coming back. It's really going to happen. In the fullness of time, when the time was right, he came to the earth to die for the sins of the world. And in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he will come again and take us, his bride, to heaven. Do you believe he's actually coming back? Listen, the Bible says he will. The Bible's very clear plain about it. People debate about the timing. Is it pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, pre-wrath? They got all kinds of theories about it, but even then it's all within 
a seven-year period. Uh, they're all close, whatever. I won't even debate about those things. But we're all pretty clear he's coming back. Do you believe that? Are you ready for his coming? Are you part of the bride of Christ? Have you trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? And if you have, if you are saved, listen, is there anything that you know God wants you to do, you know Christ wants you to do, you are his ambassador. He's got you here for a reason. If there was no other reason for you to be here, the fullness of time would be here and he'd bring you home. But he's got something for you to do if you've done everything that he wants you to do. Listen, God wants you to stay busy while you're waiting for him to return. Don't just hide in a closet somewhere saying the world's too crazy. We, we need to be active. We need to be busy. We need to be telling people about the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to occupy until he comes. This Christmas season, as we think about the first coming, and we ought to. And by the way, I'm not against any of the other stuff. Christmas, the presents, it's all good. Um, we ought to think about the real meaning of Christmas, but, but let's not forget that he promises to come back again soon in the fullness of time when the time is just right. And that time may be here before we, we think. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much, God, for just the Christmas season and all that it means. Thank you for the promises we have in the Bible that you're going to return for us, take us all home to heaven someday, likely very soon. And we all ought to think of it like it's going to happen right away. At the same time, we all ought to keep working and serving and preparing like we have a long time to be here on the earth. We still want to build the building. We still want to do a lot of different things. We still want to plan ministries and all those things. And so we'll, we'll plan and we'll act and we'll prepare like there's going to be a 2021, but we ought to anticipate your coming like it's today. And so God, I pray that you'd help us to understand that. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, nobody's looking around. Maybe you're here in the auditorium or maybe you're watching online, you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Let me just challenge it. Listen, you're running out of time to get this thing settled. The Bible is very, very plain that you're a sinner and that you're deserving of judgment. And that judgment is death, not just the physical death, but also the second death, which is death in hell. It's separation from God for all eternity. If you never trusted Christ as your Savior, Jesus loves you. He died to save you. The Bible says all you need to do is believe that the Lord Jesus came to pay your sin debt for you when he died on the cross. And if you're willing to place your trust in him and trust him and him alone, he'll save you. He'll take you to heaven when you die. The Bible is loaded with promises. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth or puts their faith on him, should not perish but have everlasting life. The Bible says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and let me in, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. One of the last invitations in the Bible, the, the word of God says, Whosoever will may come and drink of the water of life freely. If you're not saved, it's not God's fault. God did everything that needs to be done in order for you to be saved. You just need to believe and receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. And whether you're here in the auditorium or whether you're watching online, Jesus wants you to be saved. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And repentance is merely a changing of mind, heart, and attitude from your sin and your unbelief, turning to the Savior. He's the only one that can help you. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, nobody's looking around. If you're here in the auditorium, you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. I'd like to pray for you. I can't save you. I can't do anything for you except for just present Christ to you. But if that's you, you'd say, Brother Phil, please pray for me. I'm not sure I'm saved, but I'd like you to pray for me. Would you slip your hand up? Anybody like that at all? Please pray for me. I'm not sure I'm saved, but I'm concerned about it. I'd like you to pray for me. Anybody? Young person, old person, doesn't matter. I'm not sure about my salvation. If you're watching online, there's a button on our website called Why Jesus? And that, that'll take you to some verses from the scripture that'll help you to understand a little bit more about salvation and guide you through the process of receiving Christ as your Savior. Let's all stand to our feet. If God spoke to your heart, you want to come and pray at the altar. The altar's open.
Think about what's God got you to do before he comes back. Think about how much time you think you have before he comes back. Now you may have your whole life, I don't know. You may have the next 10, 15 years, but you may only have a few days. We just don't know. We'll have regrets if we have unfinished business. And believe me, I've got enough of my own. Amen. We're going to sing our closing song, our theme for the year, All the Glory Belongs to Jesus. All the glory.